Oscar Combs here, and I want to put one rumor to rest, once and for all. The story is that Rafferty's goes all out for sports fans. And let me tell you, it's absolutely true. Confirmed. And fans love Rafferty's right back because the food is so terrific. Serve fresh. Serve fast. Serve friendly. Lunch or dinner. Rafferty's menu is jam-packed with all your favorites. Steaks, prime rib, chicken, ribs, delicious dishes and generous sizes that really satisfy the appetite. So come hang with the sports crowd at Rafferty's. It's the tastiest place in town. You're listening to Conversations with Oscar Combs and his guest, Coach Joe B. Hall. In part three of Oscar's chat with Coach Hall, we start at the beginning when Coach Hall took over for Coach Rupp. And from there, you're going to hear about some of the big wins achieved by Coach Hall and the Wildcats. This is Coach Hall, candid and unfiltered, and this includes some stories about some familiar names in college basketball, including John Wooden and Kentucky's number one antagonist, Bobby Knight. More of that's upcoming in part four of Oscar's conversation with Coach Hall. We're going to hear about the celebration when Kentucky beat an undefeated Indiana team and the journey to the 1978 National Championship. Make sure you stay up to date with all of Oscar's conversations with Kentucky legends as you can follow them on Twitter at Wildcat News. All of Oscar's podcasts, including part one and part two with Coach Hall, are also available through iTunes and the Google Play Store. Just search at Wildcat News and subscribe. And of course, OscarCombs.com is always available 24-7. I'm Bo Robinson, and this has been a real blessing for me to work on this project for the Kentucky fans. And I hope you all enjoy part three of Conversations with Oscar Combs and Coach Joe B. Hall. Unlike the cupcakes of today, non-conference for many schools, including Kentucky, your first year, here is your early non-conference schedule. You played 26 games a season, 18 of which is a true round robin in the conference. And then you had Michigan State, Iowa, Indiana, North Carolina, Nebraska, Oregon, and Kansas, and Notre Dame. (laughs) No cupcakes there. And and then there was a point here when you played uh, four consecutive teams in the SEC on the road. You came back down the stretch, had the game against Tennessee, and then your two March games that year, you're in the uh, NCAA, Nashville, Tennessee. You play a team named Austin P in the first game, 106 to 100. A lot of a lot of future connections evolved out of that game. Well, one big one, uh, two of those coaches wound up as my assistants, which is the odd thing. But the big thing was they had a player by the name of Fly Williams, who was one of the best finishers I've ever seen and almost unstoppable. But we prevailed. We won. And uh, Lake Kelly was the head coach. Leonard Hamilton was his assistant. And then uh, Lake, I think, took another job, went to Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, correct. And Leonard was without a job. And I don't know if Lake couldn't take him or what. Well, Leonard, I think, stuck with him one or two more years. No, it was after that. Was it after that game? But anyway, no, I know what it was. It's Leonard felt like he couldn't move up at that time. And he went back to work for a company in Alcoa, Tennessee. Yeah, a bakery company. Something like that. that. And you met Lake somewhere, and you were looking for assistant. And Lake recommended Leonard. And I flew him up, or I asked him to come up. He drove up. And I'll never forget, he locked his keys in his trunk. And I should have taken that as a warning. <laughs> Leonard, Leonard did a lot of things like that. <laughs> There, there was a story once with Leonard that uh, supposedly you said, well, now, are you sure he can recruit the kind of kids we got here? To which Lake supposedly said, you want to know how he can recruit? Fly Williams had never seen the state of Tennessee till he came to school for the first day. <laughs> you, uh, that's a good recommendation. The next year you had your one tough year, 13-13. You sort of got caught without a true center, I think, that year. Well, Jim Anders had been our senior with the 73 Super team. Kitten. Made us a very good size team. Anders at center, guy hit at one forward. Grevy at the other, Flynn Connor at the guard. Next year, with Andrews gone, Larry Stamper gone, 
Uh, it was uh, Ronnie Lands, Mike Flynn at the guard, Connor and Grevy at the forward, and Guy Ed at the center. Three positions, we were short size. We were short at the center, short at the forward, and short at one guard. And that told. We and, just weren't big enough. And, of course, the next year was the big year, 74, 75. You start out early on, and it was just the fourth game of the season. You went to Bloomington. You lost to Indiana 98-74 and the infamous Bobby and I tap on the back of the head at the, or near the end of the game. Well, Bobby and I had been very good friends. We had served in the Olympic trials together. I guess every night Bobby and I went somewhere for dinner and a movie. Shared a bag of popcorn like Denny Crum and I. <laughs> and we fished together. We did a fishing show. We did lots of things together. We went to Idaho, uh, Wyoming, to Pete Widener's ranch. Stayed in his guest house and fished up in Wyoming. And we were very good friends. He'd come down to football games. We'd go out and have dinner. Maybe he'd come down early and we'd fish here. We got along great. In that game, he was uh, just so much better than we were early that year. He had a beautiful ball club. I mean, they were one of the best there's ever been. And he just beat us like a drum, and we couldn't do anything. In the last two or three minutes, the referees called a foul on his team, and we were shooting. And he walked all the way down in front of my bed, yelling at the referee for a bad call. And as he started back towards his bench, I said, Give me all, Bobby. <laughs> Turned around, and it looked like, a wolf man. I wish people could see your expression right now. I mean, he was just like this. Broke down, way down in the defensive position. He said, don't talk to me during the game. And turned and walked back up. And I thought, you know, he's kicked my butt. Now he's yelling at me. So I got up and followed him. And I said, Bobby, I didn't mean anything by that. I said, gosh, I'm mighty. Don't get upset at me. You've kicked her butt and you got a hell of a team. And I turned to walk away. That man back then knocked my hair up. And I turned around. He said, I didn't mean anything by that either. I couldn't do anything. Somebody, my son said I should have cold copied him. But I knew that if I'd uh, retaliate, it would look like I'd gotten my ass kicked and couldn't take it. And after the game in the locker room? Well, before the we left floor, the AD came out and said, you all walk on floor together. Uh, I refused. A lot of people point back to that game that night, the reaction both publicly and perhaps within the team. Five nights later, you came back and had one of the really great games in the Kentucky-North Carolina series at Freedom Hall. Oh, yeah. Was that the turning point in that season? Yeah, we came out. First half, we're getting drunk. We go to the locker room halftime. I tell Dick Parsons, I said, Dick, I said, Dick, if we don't snap out, Go find a trash can and set it on fire so they'll evacuate Jim and end the game. And he laughed. And uh, we came out saying, hey, I benched a starter. Because we were playing timid, weren't getting aggressive, weren't playing tough, hard nose basket. I set them on the bench and let them watch. And they nudged me because we were ready to play. That season carried on. You only lost three games the rest of the way. Really, really playing well. And then you got to the NCAA tournament. Uh, you opened up with Marquette. We drove Marquette. It's 22 points. Worst defeat Al McGuire ever had. And then you, you beat a really good Central Michigan team. A lot yeah. of teams that had overlooked. And then came the Indiana game that probably couldn't have come against a better opponent because effectively that night you kept Indiana from being back-to-back undefeated national champions. Yeah. Couldn't have been a sweeter moment. Never a sweeter moment than to have won that game. You went up there. And I never saw a bunch of young men play every possession like it was life and death. And it had to be doubly good for one of the guys out there, the guard, Indiana kid, Mike Flynn. Yeah, Mike uh, had a great game. I think he was our leading scorer. In the stands that night, a young Dwight Anderson you, you were recruiting. Never forget his mother and father there at that game because they were there in Dayton. That's where yeah. he went to school. Describe just a little bit the bus ride home from Dayton 
through Cincinnati, well, Northern Kentucky, and into Lexington. <clears throat> that was the most unreal situation that I've ever been in. After the game, I told Kaywood what I'd written on the board before the game. When we were all settled in the locker room before we went out after the warm-up, I told uh, Kaywood that before the game, I sat everybody down in front of the blackboard, and I very quietly went up and wrote, Nets, bus, state police, coliseum on the board. Sat back down. I said, fellas, after this game, in this win, we'll cut the nets down from a ladder and scissors. No knife. Be very careful when you cut the nets. We'll all go home on the bus. Nobody will ride with girlfriend or family. We're all going back together. When we cross the old High River, the state police will escort us to the Coliseum where we'll have the biggest celebration UK has ever seen. It was pretty well packed when you got back. It was a day gone to sink. I ever saw. When we crossed the Ohio River, about three state police cars, one front, two behind, led us through Newport or Coving. There was people out in fields with signs standing at the fence on the interstate, all the way to Lexington. When we got to Scott County, the Scott County sheriffs picked us up. We got Fayette County, the Fayette County sheriff. Got to campus, the campus police. We went to the Coliseum, and like you say, it was near packed. Probably needed the next five days off just to get everybody back <laughs> to earth before well, you took on <laughs> Syracuse in the Final Four. Well, we blistered Syracuse. They had three guards. One of them was a penetrator. One of them was a outside shooter, and the other one was a playmaker. Whenever they put the shooter in, we'd go man to man. Whenever they put the penetrator in, we go zone, and we just skip them off back. That same afternoon, UCLA played Louisville. Kid from Louisville, I think it was maybe Terry Howard. Does that strike a bell? Yeah, it's a Had way. not missed a single free throw the entire season. Missed a free throw to end that cost them. Could have get an overtime. Yeah. So yeah. the next day, the press conference. Was the worst day of my life. <laughs> We're sitting in the audience, and John Wooden announces that that's his last year. He's retiring after the final. And I could have fallen out of my chair because we were in San Diego. The crowd was mostly UCLA. He was going after his 10th national title. Didn't have that great a team. That was not the usual UCLA team. They were definitely beatable. In fact, I think Louisville would have beat them. Could have beaten them and took them to overtime. That game... We had been known as a physical basketball team. The papers written, wrote us up as brutalizing the game. Other coaches said, you should wear football pads. We had two big guys, Roby and Phillips, played aggressive, and they were big, but there wasn't a mean bone in their body. They weren't intimidating. They just played hard, and it made it a physical game. The head of the officials told the officials, to not let the game become a physical game. The result of that was close scrutiny on Roby and Phillips. And for 15 solid minutes during that game, we played Bob Gayette at center with both Roby and Phillips on the bench at the same time. 15 minutes of that game, they both were sitting there. And that made us back to that small team that we had trouble with in the 13-13 year. But, but we still hung in there, and we had a chance down to strength. We were down by about four points, might have been five, with just a few minutes to go. Myers was called for a foul and then a technical. So Grevy, he had fouled Grevy. So Grevy had a one and one and a technical. So a possible three-point play and the ball out of bounds. Grevy gets to the free throw line. The referee's out there at Ray Dandy Ball. And here comes Wood from the bench to the free throw circle. I don't mean he was on the game floor. I'm telling you, he's standing right beside Grevy, refer giving the referee down the road. An obvious technical foul. I mean, it has to be a technical foul. Wooden won't go back to the bench. Grevy's staying there getting dirt. Nobody thought of that. 
But to have that referee out there begging Coach Wooden to get off floor, and he won't go. He's game by the elbow. Please, Mr. Wooden, get off. Go back to the bench, please. Trying to walk him back. I walk to the scores table and say, let him shoot his free throws now. And this referee looks at me, says, you get back on the bench, or it's a technical. And here he is with Wooden begging him. So Grevy misses the one and one, misses the technical. We get the ball out of bounds. We run a play with a cut under the basket. James Lee is called for a moving screen. And that's the whole game right there. But it was an unbelievable season, capped off by beating Indiana, getting to the Final Four, something that Kentucky had not done since 1966. And that was sort of, I thought, the turning point in the whole well, state embracing you as the leader of the program. Yeah, it, no question. It uh, took a lot of pressure off of me. But what a win would have done. That just, you know, I think a world of John Wood and what he accomplished. No question. But to allow him to intimidate the referees and unnerve Grevy at that time. Grevy had chance to be on the airplane on the same flight with Wooden and was sitting next to him. And he told him, he said, you know, Mr. Wooden, I got to say, Coach, if you hadn't announced your retirement, I think we would have beaten you. And Wooden said, Kevin, if you'd have played better defense, you would have beat us. Back then, it seems like around the country, when you had a big run, you made it to the Final Four. Anybody that made it to the Final Four other than UCLA went into a rebuilding stage for a couple of years. And in your particular situation, losing those four players from 70, uh, 75, 75, 76 sort of become a rebuilding year for you. We were able to recruit some real good talent at that time. We got, uh, we got Dwight Anderson. Cal Macy came into our program. We had uh, Roby and Phillips as uh, growing, getting more experience. We had backups like Freddie Cowan, LeVon Williams. We had Jay Scheidler. Right we before had- that, in 76, you took Indiana to overtime at Freedom Hall. Actually had the lead no, late the, in the game. I don't believe it went to overtime, did it? Yes. Did it? Kent Benson hit a field goal. Tip in that sent it to overtime. It's seventy seven yeah. to sixty eight in overtime. I did okay. But he you had uh, the ball. He actually hit the ball with his fist. That's right, that's right. When fifteen feet in the air came right down through That's the right. Way. But right before that we he had, had the, the ball. lead and Larry put up a shot that he probably shouldn't have put up. No. We had the lead and about thirty five seconds to go and the ball. Yes. And I was I always like to break the tension after a few seconds. In other words, come down, know they're going to really put the defense on us and try to get a steal. But wait about 10 seconds, eat in that clock a little, call a timeout, get everybody backed off, settle down. So I was going to call the time, and Larry cut across the middle, wide open, and put up that little fade that he normally hit. But it didn't go in that day. didn't go in. So, later on that season, you had Roby to go down with an injury. And at one point, you were 10-10. and 10, But you won the last six games of the regular season and got invited to the NIT at a time that you were only taking 32 teams to the NCAA, which today meant the next 32 that goes there today wasn't even allowed. You went to NIT, 16 teams. Eight of the 16 were ranked in the top 25, and you were without Roby. That was a, a pretty good bunch of young men. I know um, Reggie Warford had uh, moved in, was playing good ball. Of course, we had Larry Johnson. We had uh, Phillips and Givens and Lee. 
Lee had had a great NC NIT tournament. I think he would have made all NIT. That championship game, he just wasn't himself. And I said, James, what's wrong? He said, I just don't feel like playing. <laughs> I said, look over on the scores table. See that trophy? I said, we're playing for the championship. I know, coach, but I just can't, I just don't feel it. You opened that tournament beating a good Niagara team, 67 to 61. Next game, you beat Kansas State. Real good. Had two good guards. And but you, I think that was a game that you should have been playing in Louisville when they got upset by Providence. By Providence, they which got, was your third game. So we played the team that beat Louisville. That and Michigan. then you played Charlotte. Now let me make a statement. Okay. When we got beat by Middle Tennessee and would have played Louisville had we beaten them, everybody said we dodged Louisville on purpose. Well, now, did they dodge us uh, by if, letting if you, go, if you go with that scenario, they dodged you in 75 in, the in finals, San Diego when they let UCLA beat them. And they dodged us in 76 in the in NIT. IT. So that works both ways. Now, in the championship game, when you played UNC Charlotte, the head coach was Lee Rose from Transylvania here in Lexington, and his assistant was Mike Pratt, whom you had coached. Yeah, and uh, Lee and I were along the same church. Yeah. And we fought as to who uh, the reverend was, whose bench he was going to sit. In that, in that particular game, they did have one terrific player in Cornbread Maxwell. What a name. Yeah, and uh, they had another player that was good. Was his name Massey? I think so. Yeah, I think so. They were very good. So, and uh, they got us in trouble, and we had everybody on the bench in foul trouble. We were just struggling to, to hold on, and they started holding the ball. So we just backed off, and by their time, not to get anybody else in foul trouble, get a rest. Then we put our guys in that were in foul trouble and walked away with it. Brings you back to 76-77, one of my favorite teams. Had a really good year, and then when you got right at the tournament time, had the misfortune. First ever Mideast Regional to be held at Rupp Arena. And if you can finish ahead of Tennessee, you get to stay at home. And they won the tiebreaker. They came to the Mideast Regional, King, and we went to Ernie and Bernie. Two of the best Tennessee ever had. Bernard King may have been the best player in Maybe equality to, to Magic Johnson and uh, Jordan, Michael Jordan. You get to the tournament that year, you open up by beating Princeton, and then you beat Virginia military before you take on North Carolina. At that time, there was no clock. Dean Smith had pretty much made famous the four corners, particularly if he got a lead late in the game. They got up double digits in the first half and went to the corners in the first half. I don't think I'd ever seen anybody play as good a defense against the corners in the last half as Kentucky. And you got it down to a one-possession game and a terrible call on Larry Johnson. It should have been a charge, and it was a block. There, we also had uh, their guard trap in the backcourt, and he to get out of it, he just ran over one of the guys that was trapped. They didn't call. And then the no call or the wrong call on Larry was a John big Kuster. Was a big play. But it would have given you the ball and the opportunity to go ahead. Yeah. Was yeah. that was how tough a defeat was that in your career? It was uh we I felt that team, the seventy seven team, was as good as seventy eight. We didn't have Macy, but we had Larry Johnson who was a great player. Larry Johnson was one of the best defensive guards I've ever seen and a hard worker. And, uh, of course, uh, we had Scheidler and uh, Roe William Phillips and Lava and Freddie. I, I thought you were better than anybody in the Final Four that year. Yeah, I thought so. So the next year comes back to perhaps maybe another pressure year. You had the 75. You won the NIT in 76. You were right there at the end in 77. You come out in 78, and right at the get-go, the big X was on your chest. We were number one from the start of the year. We only lost it when we lost to Alabama and the LSU. And, and uh, they were both uh, typical of things that can have it happen to a team that is playing that good. We just finally got complacent and looking ahead to the tournament, and uh, in neither game did we play our game. And in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, other than Kentucky, 
that's probably two toughest home court advantages in the SEC. I mean, Alabama and LSU had terrific home court crowds when they played a big game against Kentucky. They had tremendous talent. Both teams, uh, Alabama had, had a ton of guys go to the pros. Oh, yeah, and LSU was uh, always on a high. And uh, Dale had them fired up, and, and uh, they he made it tough. So we get to the tournament. You play Hugh Durham in Florida State. Halftime. I'll let you take it from there. Well, the, uh, the situation was a, a remake of the Alabama uh, LSU game. We came out and just weren't ready to play. And I could see it. It it just scared me to death. I had let them flounder like that in those two games. And in the Middle Tennessee game when we lost to the NC. For some reason, we're going to sleep in that game. And you can tell it by the tempo, by the quickness defensively, how hard they're going after loose ball. And we just didn't have it. And the timeouts didn't help. Nothing helped. So second half, we're in the locker room, and I tell the starters, I said, I'm not going to let you lose this game like you did at Alabama and LSU. I said, if anybody's going to lose it, I'm going to lose it. And I said, I'm not going to go with you guys that are going to lose it for me. And so I benched three of them and uh, – couldn't take everybody out, so I left Macy and Phillips in. And all of the pressure came on them, Freddie Cowan, LeVon Williams, and uh, Dwayne Casey. They uh, looked to Phillips and uh, Macy to carry it out for us. So they went to those two, and they delivered offensively. And then we started converting defensively on the re- on uh, runouts, and we stopped their run out, and we gradually started coming back. And uh, I think we were nine down at one time, and the second half we cut it to five. And I put starters back, and we won. And then I was... But I told Dick, coming out of the locker room, I said, Dick, if this don't work, we're not going back to Lexington. <laughs> we, won't be, we won't be welcome. A week later, you're right back where you were three years earlier. Dayton, Ohio, taking on Miami of Ohio, which was a, a good club. Mike Phillips had a sensational game. Everything we threw to him, he put in a basket. And uh, that's kind of the way that team was. It'd be uh, Roby one night, it'd be Macy another, Givens another. But uh, that game belonged to Phillips. He just destroyed them. Which earned you a night against a freshman the name of Magic Johnson of Michigan State. Well, this one really bothered me because I'd seen Magic in high school and uh, um, the coach at Michigan State was one of the best uh, zone defense coaches in the country. And they had the best 2-3 zone that I'd ever seen. And their two guys out front were so quick they could cover your three, the two wings and your point guard. And uh, about your only opportunity for attack was up the middle. And they were tough there. And Magic Johnson, uh, his fame was getting out on the break, uh, either going all the way or making the sensational pass. And he was uh, a true team player and had all the savvy of an experienced player. But uh, we uh, we were not going to get caught watching him, and we were going to make sure we covered the guys he, he usually kicked off to. And then in the last half, I told Leonard, I said, Leonard, we got to set some picks for Macy and get him some shots. He's not getting loose against his zone. And he said, uh, I said, let's... Uh, Let's see if we can get some screens on Macy. Laird said, let Roby come up. So we did. We let Mike, uh, Rick come up, scream for Macy. They foul Macy, and I think he had, what, four or six down the street? Four or five. And uh, we found some offense, loosened them up, and came back and won that game. 
Another trip back. It was back, a big win. Another trip back I down said I-75. After, I said after the Michigan State game, I said they'll win it the next year, and they, and did. they did. Back home down I-75 and then out to St. Louis. And we had to face Arkansas in the first game, and uh, Coach Eddie Sutton, who later followed me, and uh, Eddie had a great team to make it to the Final Four. They were uh, a very sound ball club. Had the three uh, the musketeers, yeah. the triplets, uh, Burrs, Delf, and uh, Mon- Moncrief. And they were all three great players, really could do it all. And that was a very tough game. It was one that uh, every possession was important. And uh, But I remember we broke her press with the uh, Rick Rick throwover for Jack. And uh, when we broke the press, I think a couple of times, well, it really hurt them. There was one particular play there where Jack was on the baseline and it clipped the backboard and went in. You knew that he had the golden touch. That well, night. that was in the Duke game. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. from beginning to end, that Duke game come almost 40 years later to what Duke in t- Kentucky means to college basketball. That was the first big Kentucky win over Duke yeah. in this long series. They were a real good ball club. They had uh, Banks that was a freshman of the year. Spinarkle, just so, And they had uh, a kid on the wing that uh, was good at running out on the break. And we had to, to stop their break was a big thing we worked on. I don't think they got a fast break point on the whole night. Again, after like 75, after 78, you were into reload again. In 78 9, you had Dwight Anderson coming in, Clarence Tillman coming in. Can't we, remember who the third player was. You had three guys on that that came in as freshmen. Brett Erber, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That was, that was the beginning of some changes within the SEC that you didn't particularly like because you had the postseason tournament, which meant you could win you could win the league, but if you don't win the tournament, you might not get in. The league was the true test because you played everybody home and away. That tournament that year, not only did it change everything, they came up with a concept in a year that Kentucky was down. That allowed the top two teams in the SEC record-wise to get double buys into the SEC tournament semifinals which meant you only had to win two games to win the tournament. tournament. But on the other end, you had to play four if you weren't one of those two teams. And that was a tournament where you had that phenomenal 101-100 to 100 game against Alabama. Uh, Macy and Clayder. Yes. Hitting outside. Yes. And Dwight Anderson was on that team. Yeah. And then Dwight broke his wrist. Yes. Against LSU, but we still won the game. Yes. And then – Lost to Tennessee in the in the championship. Tennessee, it was on their second game, and you had to play four there. Came on, played the NIT with Anderson out, and you had to play, I think it was a Monday night game. You just got to play in four days in a row. It's going to be the fifth game in six days. And that pretty much was a rebuilding season. You come back to 1980, and now you really reloaded. you got a guy by the name of Sam Bowie on the floor. Jim Meister, Dickie Beal, Dirk Minifield, Charles Hurt. Derek Horde. Derek Horde. You start out in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, Hall of Fame game. Almost win it, lose it in overtime. But to Duke. Duke. I remember that game very well and a uh, couple of mistakes we made down the stretch. I remember we threw the ball to one of the players, and he was standing out of bounds. <laughs> But he caught it. So we weren't totally alert that we should have been in that game. Well, you ended up with a 29-6 record that year. It was a great year. And you came down and you actually got to play, I think, in Rupp Arena at the end of the season. There's another regional finals. And you ended up playing Duke again and uh, in, the, in the Sweet 16. Macy had a shot at the horn. That we thought he was fouled. Yes. He still got a home. huge bruise on the elbow. I saw it last <laughs> week. But it was a great season, though. Oh, yeah, it was a good one. But any time you lose that last one, it, it stings and sticks with you for a long time. 81-82 season were great season. Just some unfortunate things happened near the end. 
the uh, Middle Tennessee and the UAB. But you come back in 83, and when you come back in 83, in 82 was tough because you lost Sam Bowie for the year. And then you come back to 83, and you don't know it until right up until October, and suddenly again, no Sam Bowie. He had an unusual stress fracture, and uh, we had the best uh, bone specialist in the United States working on him. Calendrucio of Memphis, and uh, we had uh, all kinds of therapy. We tried electrical impulses. We did everything in the world to try to speed his healing. But uh, sometimes those stress factors can be uh, very difficult to deal with. Sometimes there's not enough break that it would allow healing to her to occur inside the crack and they just stay there forever and that's what Sam's did it might have been better to have gone in there and and grind it out a little bit to create a irritable surface that would have taken healing but we did everything in the world and poor Sam baby dead leg for a year and a half trying to get it well. You you go into 82, 83, and at first you think you're going to have Sam, then you don't. And then you pretty much take most of the year trying to build chemistry, knowing you're not going to have Sam the rest of that year. Yeah, we we knew pretty well that he wasn't going to be back. And we just had to go with what we had. You lost Melvin, him. we had. Turpin. And uh, we had Charlie Hurt. And we had Horde. And Dirk, Jim Master, we still had a pretty good bunch of athletes. You you lost Indiana on the road that year early, but then you come down and get into the tournament. And when you get into the tournament, suddenly you face Indiana again. Knoxville, Tennessee. And it's a really good Indiana team. And most people thought there ain't going to be a dream game because Kentucky's not going to beat Indiana. <laughs> but you did. What do you remember about the Indiana game? Very little. I know that uh, we played way over our heads. We uh, faced them and put them down on everything that they tried. We used the one three one zone lot against them, and uh, we discovered their attack from films of some of our previous games, and uh, we stopped everything that they tried innovative against the one three one. They came in the game ranked fifth in the country, and you were ranked 12th. And you beat them, and then you move up, and you play a Louisville team that's ranked number two in the country. And I believe that was the uh, regional where they beat Arkansas the same day that Kentucky beat Indiana. Yeah, they did. Arkansas had a kid named Walker. I thought Arkansas would, had a chance to beat them. Of course, we would have rather played Arkansas. And uh, – we matched up a lot better against them. But uh, Louisville had a, a tremendous team. They had one of the best pressing teams that I've ever seen anybody have. Rick Patino teams have good presses. But uh, then he had trappers that were long and tall and strong. And, boy, when they put you two of you in that box, there was no place to go. You went in that game like an eight-point underdog, and it was sort of like, I think Brent Musburger once said, hey, everybody's got to have a heavy. Every game has a heavy. Every story has a heavy. Kentucky, you're the heavy where you like it or not. <laughs> in fearing that no matter who you played, the other team was Cinderella. Yeah. But you went into that game. That was the uh, dream game yes. for Louisville Yes. to play us. And uh, they did. They had the McCray and Jones and really a good ball club. But at the, Garden. At the end of the game, score tied. Less well, than a half a minute to go. You got the ball and you call timeout. Well, the uh, in regulation. Regulation. We had a chance to win it with the ball in hand. I called timeout, and it was about – 30 seconds, and I said, fellas, we don't want to shoot till there's eight seconds on the clock. 
And here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep it out front, and we're going to set a pick, Kenny, and you roll, and we're either going to take the jumper, go all the way, or hit Kenny, kick back Kenny for a Well, as it turned out, all of a sudden, Dirk Menefield found himself wide open. Nobody guarding him. And all he was supposed to do was relay the ball. And uh, he saw the opening. And I, I don't blame him for going for it because a layup would have been a win. And, and, in, and then in that era at that time, two things that you don't have today. Number one, you don't stop the clock when you score in no. the last minute of play. No. You score with five or six seconds, the game is yeah. over. So yeah. anyway, And there was no three-point shot. So he went in for the layup, and it either got blocked or it was golden. I never looked at the field. Well, it see. looked it looked like that uh, Charlie Jones had just looked like Dirk didn't know whether he wanted to dunk it or yeah. lay it off the glass. It looked like he just sort of got just a piece of it. Yeah, he he probably could have dunked it. Yeah, but uh, he tried to lay it up, and and Jones got a piece of it. So they go down to score, which puts them two up. And there's about eight seconds left. We come up, master, it's a jump shot. That ties it up, and but we we're spent. We've had to fight back, and then the press during the overtime just killed. But I think most of the people that day, or particularly the people that wanted to see Cinderella Lowell win, win big, they sort of had to say, "Boy, Kentucky put up a heck of a fight." Yeah, I think so, but that's not much consolation. <laughs> the thing that uh, was really important to me was the way that we fought without Bowie. I think when we came back the next fall and played them with Bowie, and it might have been, I believe it was on. A couple of interesting stories that go. We talked about this, Bo and I, earlier on a podcast we did about the series. As you come back the next year, Bowie is healthy. You've got the dream game put in place. You played it on Thanksgiving weekend. And WTBS the Superstation, bought the rights to that game. It was going to be such a big deal. And they even had a one-hour pregame special <laughs> before it. I went back and checked it the other night. You know who the host on that pregame special was? A young kid Rick wore a, a trench coat. I'm like, Craig Sager <laughs> did the preseason. Now, Joe Dean and uh, one of the guys from TBS did the play-by-play. Mm-hmm. But Craig Sager wanted to do the pregame special on this and that was a game of course when you come out from the get-go and 65 to 44 i mean it yeah. was a butt kicking yeah. and after the game uh sports illustrated put out a special cover showed sam Bowie blocking jeff hall shot yeah. and the lead headline was okay louisville you wanted kentucky you got them how do you like that now <laughs> What do you remember about that particular game? Well, I just remember it was the worst defeat they had had in Crumb's years there. But uh, the thing that was so evident was the way we handled the press was with Sam. Sam could take the middle of that press. And you see over and him. And make the next pass. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we broke their press, we had a field day. I, f- I felt certain if we'd had Sam in that final game, game, 83, we would have won it because we had no one to put in the middle to handle that press. That, I tried Turpin. I tried Charlie Hurd. I tried just about everybody, and we just couldn't break it with anybody in the middle like Sam could. You, you go back to that 83 season again, Part of that great recruiting class was absent one player, and that was Ralph Sampson. Had you got Ralph Sampson, there's no telling how history would have changed for Kentucky in that four-year stretch. Well, it would have changed for me because I would have been so happy. I may have lost my senses having Bowie and Turpin and Sampson. <laughs>